welcome back to Calabunga Corner. And this episode, we are talking with David Peterson, who is doing the artwork for the covers on the micro series of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles by IDW. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Your artwork has been fantastic. We've been watching as each issue comes out, you got a new cover, and everyone's excited. I know this is a big thrill. So the first question is, when and how did you get into art? Have you always been into art? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, my mom remembers me drawing as early as like two or three. Uh, and then I got I got kind of seriously into drawing uh, probably middle schoolish age and two big influences were um, the X-Men comics that I was reading at the time and the Turtles comics that I was reading at the time so uh, and the Turtles were actually the first thing in comics that I ever saw where I could kind of um, I it, it made more sense that somebody drew this somebody wrote this where with the X-Men comics it just kind of all even though I knew this issue was written by Chris Claremont and drawn by Dave Cockrum or drawn by John Byrne. It just didn't seem like people had done it. There was still this like corporate thing. But with Eastman and Laird's Ninja Turtles, it was like, wow, this is just two guys doing this comic. This is something people can do. I, I could draw comics, maybe. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad Ninja Turtles was an inspiration Huge there. inspiration, yeah. So were you into the comic books before the show came out? Or how were you introduced into the Turtles? I think I saw an ad for the show or or something or, or a promo that it was going to be coming on next fall or you know something like that um, but I just I saw it that one little blip and then went on summer vacation and on summer vacation is when I started trying to just draw them from memory I, did, I had no idea even what they were I just saw these turtles and they had weapons and I thought that's cool and I tried drawing them and when I got back from vacation I think is when I found about found out about the comics so the comics at least in terms of story and exposure, what came first. I think it was a spark of seeing an ad for the cartoon on, on the air that, that got me, but after that it was I was all, all comics. What was your first published work? Uh, my first published work was my first issue of Mouse Guard, my own book. Uh, Mouse Guard's a medieval fantasy about mice with swords. So, uh, yeah, I, I did an issue that I self-published and then got picked up by my current publisher, Archaea. So whether you count the self-published version or the nationally published version uh, by Archaea, that was whichever one of those came first uh, in terms of legitimacy is is my first published work. Okay, what was it like going through the self-publishing thing? I know Eastman and Laird did that too when they started off. Yeah. Uh, was that a challenge or was so it easy? It, it was it was a lot easier for me than it was for them, but that's because of the advent of things like print on demand. Um, Instead of having to do a big print run and, and cash out or you know put out a lot of money up front and then hope that it's going to pay off, um, I was I was using a service where I could print anywhere from one copy to as many copies as I wanted. Um, there was no minimum to order, so I, I ended up printing um, about a hundred and took them to a local convention and did pretty well with it. But after that, I did one more like little bumper printing just to kind of get me through. Um, Getting, make, making sure family had them, making sure friends had them. I had a couple people emailing me saying that they heard about this book and maybe I'd send them out. But um, I, in total, I think I only printed about 200 copies, 250 copies or so of that of that issue because it was just kind of a local effort. And then it was after that that one of those issues I presented to Archaea, and they um, they ended up printing. So it it was it was much easier for me than it was. For them, I don't. I didn't have to worry about big print runs and, and hoping that it sells and dealing with distributors or anything like that. That's handy. That's very yeah. handy. Uh, and that's print on demand. Yeah, print on the company that I used was called Comics Press. C O M I X Press. Um, there's all, there are other ones. There's one called Kablam. Um, I know I'm blanking on a couple others, but there there are more options out there as well now. Now, with doing this, you've done a, how many comics with the, the Mouse Guard so far? How many have been released? Uh, I've done, I do them in six issue batches. So the first one was called, the first batch was called Fall. So six issues of that. Six issues of the follow up called Winter. Now I'm doing a third series called The Black Axe, and I'm working on issue five currently. So out of those uh, 12, uh, 17 issues of the main series, 
We also did a spin-off series um, called Legends of the Guard that was an anthology where guest artists came and, and told kind of like the tall tales of legends. How long did it take for Mouse Guard to pick up with the popularity? Because I know when I go to conventions, people are always buying prints and stuff and showing me. Uh, it, it happened pretty quick. Like I said, I had that local convention experience where I was selling them and then um, and then I went to a publisher and they were interested in it. And it went, as soon as it was solicited in Diamond, uh, people, comic shop owners were like, I, I love this idea, this little mouse with a sword, that got to get that. And I, I went to the New York Comic Con. New York Comic Con's first uh, show, the, the inaugural one, was, you know, it started on Friday. So it was three days after, or two days after New Comic Book Day. And that New Comic Book Day was when the first issue of Mouse Guard hit nationally. And so I was in New York, and the guys at Big Apple Comics said, we sold out already, and it's only Friday. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then they told me how many copies they ordered, and it was like, that's more than I did in my initial run. That's crazy. So yeah, it, it kind of just took off immediately. People liked the imagery, and, and I was fortunate. What was your inspiration in your story with Mouse Guard? I like animal stories. Um, obviously the turtles, but things like Wind in the Willows, Aesop's Fables. And um, I did a, a fair amount of role playing as a kid, playing the turtles role playing game, but also playing Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. And uh, I just thought it'd be kind of cool to put together some of my experiences, um, kind of like in a patrol in Boy Scouts, plus in a patrol in Dungeons and Dragons with animal story characters. All sounds different, but like yeah, yeah, it, it all kind right. of right. Yeah, when you think about Mouse Guard, that is kind of all the parts put in. Yeah. yeah. So that works out just. Wow, and brought in a lot of readers for you. So. Yeah, yeah, it was it was instantaneous. It was no, pretty cool. You, uh, you're doing the guest covers for IDW. Mm -hmm. Have you done other guest art in other comic books since the start happening? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've done a couple. I've done a couple pinups and a couple miscellaneous covers for other books, and then kind of my my big run of of guest work was for the Muppet comics. Um, when, when Boom had them. They, Boom had kind of two Muppet series going simultaneously. There was the Muppet Show, that was the one that Roger Langridge did. And he did all the interiors and the covers up until pretty close to the end. Uh, I was doing what they called the Muppet Classics line, which was more like using the Muppets as a repertory theater, telling, retelling fairy tales, folk tales, that kind of thing. So they did Muppet Peter Pan, Muppet Robin Hood, Muppet King Arthur, Muppet Snow White, Muppet Sherlock Holmes, and I did. Um, I ended up doing all but one of those covers. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I it was. Uh, they were four issues each, and so I was doing four, you know, four covers per series. And when they got to the Sherlock Holmes one, I was just I was so bogged down with other work. I said, <laughs> "I'm really sorry, guys. I'm I'm gonna be able to only do one cover this time." And then they ended up making that series only two issues long. So had I just done one more cover, I would have been able to say I'd done the whole run. That's really, really cool stuff. So you, you've worked on now two projects that have had hints in history at least. That's true, yeah. The Turtles. And then my, my publisher, Archaic, like when, um, when, when Henson was, sold the Muppets to Disney, um, the main Muppets, you know, the Muppet Show characters, Disney owns those now. The, the division of property was that Henson still owns things like Dark Crystal, Fraggle Rock, Storyteller, etc. So, while Boom had the license for the Muppet comics at the time, the, the like Muppet Show comics, um, Arkea, the publisher who does Mouse Guard, got the rights to do Dark Crystal, Labyrinth, Storyteller, Fraggle Rock, etc. So I've also had the opportunity to do a Dark Crystal piece, uh, uh, a storyteller piece and Fraggle Rock. Uh, Fraggle Rock piece. That's really, really cool. That's awesome yeah. stuff. Yeah, I've been pretty fortunate that like, a lot of things that kind of inspired me to do creative work when I was younger, I've now gotten a chance to work on as an adult. So now with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you mentioned that that was something you got on early. Uh, which was your favorites of the, the comic series? Which um, part of Mirage really held you? Uh, I think the the original first uh, three or four issues probably the the stuff that dealt with origin and although I, I don't know I guess the stuff that ended up being the farm going out to the farm also really held me. Did you get into the cartoon series at all, or did you just stay with the not, comics? Not much. Uh, I, I was I was a fan of the comics and how serious they were. Um, and so then when the cartoon series came on, it was a bit of a disappointment for me because of how kid-friendly and kind of silly 
things became. For, you know, it, it just seemed like it was too lighthearted. They felt almost felt to me like they were making fun of something that was important to me. Um, obviously, that wasn't the intention at all, and it was you know a teenage me getting yeah. angry about yeah, yeah. this isn't the way it was in the books. So. Um, yeah, I, I didn't really get into it, but I realize that that's you know that has just as much canon value for for fans as as the books do, if not more so. Um, now, do you have a favorite turtle, favorite character? Of I think I think probably Michelangelo was was the one that I enjoyed and and, um, and try to focus on the most. I think you know it's just like with Batman where there's how many different versions of Batman over the years where different creators have come in or different creative teams and have you know come up with this is this is how Batman acts here well but in this one he acts like this and in this one he acts like this and, um, depending on whether you're talking about the cartoon the Archie the movie which movie the Mirage series which Mirage series <laughs> yeah. all the characters are slightly different and so um, uh, the Michelangelo that I I see that I, that I appreciate is almost like um, a middle child peacemaker in like a family kind of situation where you know it's classic that the middle child is the one or, the, or sometimes the baby is the one that feels like they have to bring peace to the family don't fight don't fight kind of thing and so they're just trying to be cheerful and lighthearted just to kind of ease the tension and uh, that's how I always saw Michelangelo even though I don't know it was ever specifically written that way that he was in a lot of ways kind of overly jovial or lighthearted um, to I mean that, that was in some of his nature anyways but yeah he was he was that even more so because he felt responsible to to make the peace when Raph and Leo couldn't get along or Splinter was disappointed in one of them for failing or you know, that it was Michelangelo who was kind of like, "Yay! Look at me! I'm going to do a silly dance, or yeah. I'm going to keep—I'm going to tell a joke. I'm going to keep it lighthearted." <laughs> yeah. So Michelangelo was—I I appreciated that. With your history in turtles, like in the comics and everything, how did you get approached, or did you approach IDW? How did you get into doing the cover? With, with IDW, um, Bobby Chernow emailed and said, "Hey, I'd like to do—I'd like you to do some." Godzilla covers if you're interested. And I was kind of swamped at the time and said, well, I appreciate, you know, I like doing cover work because it gives me a break from doing mice, but isn't so demanding that it's like doing another series of something. I can, I can fit covers in. But right now it's kind of a bad time and I feel like I can only do that if it's something that I really, like, love. If it's a job I just couldn't say no to. And I don't have anything against Godzilla. You know, some of the movies were cool, but there's nothing about Godzilla that I... I absolutely love that that makes me feel like I have to do this and uh, and so he said well how about turtles do you like the turtles and I sent back an email within you know two minutes showing not you know describing not only how much I love them but also sending them samples yeah that I had because I already had samples oh that's yeah just I mean just drawing works. you know fan stuff just so yeah, with uh, the, the covers and everything, we've been really excited with all the different covers coming out. Uh, now, with yours, do you get an idea of what's going on in the comic before drawing the cover, or do you just say, we need this character as a... Yeah, because I'm doing the, the micros, um, the, the whole idea is just epitomize the, try to epitomize the character on the cover. Um, and no, I don't know anything about what's actually happening in the issue. Um, which had, at times kind of proved to be difficult. There was, by the time I was getting around to the Leo cover, it was like, okay, I've shown them in the sewer, on a rooftop, on a fire escape. Um, I'm kind of running out of places to put them that's like a New York City backdrop. And I was coming up with ideas for maybe against the Foot Clan or whatever, but I thought, I don't know who's in the Leo issue. Like, I don't know what happens in it. So um, I was actually in New York at that time when I was trying to do things. So I scouted a few locations and found an alley that I kind of liked. So. That works. Yeah, I just I went, I went with that. But yeah, yeah, I, I have no idea what's going on in the issue. Have you had any touch with any of the other people who work on the issues, like Ryan Lynch, who's been the writer? Nope, nope. Um, I am uh, Charles Paul Wilson, who's doing the, uh, the Splinter issue, the Splinter Interiors. He and I know each other just because we both have all ages comics. He has he does a book called Stuff of Legend. And so we just know each other from conventions that way. But also he just contributed a pinup to um, to my book. And so we had been in talk 
in touch about that, and he said, "Oh, by the way, I just I just got your splinter cover because I'm the one doing the interior." So he and I have been chatting a little bit, but like I said, it's already after the cover's done. So yeah, yeah, it's more like chatting like colleagues and friends than it is uh, business talking about you know trying to coordinate or anything. Now, do you send in more than one concept idea for a cover, and they choose one, or do you just? Do your art and send it out, and they, they take what you send. Um, yeah, you, I mean, I'm I'm sending in a rough sketch. Or, you know, it's supposed to be a rough sketch, but I don't really do rough well. I <laughs> I end up having to do a lot of details, and because I feel like when it's rough, they don't get it. There's more open to interpretation, and they'll say, "Well, why is this like this?" And I'll say, well, "That's actually a building in the background. I know it just looks like a weird scribble, but that's a building." And I go, <laughs> "Oh, okay. Well, we don't like that building." It's, it's, I feel like it just opens yourself up more. So the more kind of concrete I make the sketch, the better chance they're actually going to understand what my idea is. I've even go, gone so far to just do a really rough color scheme, like just just a flat color showing, like this is where it's going to be light, this is where it's going to be dark. Um, so they get it. Like especially with the Donatello cover, where he's in a sewer and there was a light source, he has a lantern on his bow staff. Um, I wanted to really show not just the sketch, but show that it's dark over here, but light here, and there's going to be some cool lighting on his face. And uh, but yeah, I send in one one thing, and and then they suggest any changes that they feel have to be made. Um, on the first several, there was no change. I just did the sketch. They liked it. Did the cover. They liked it. Last couple ones, they've they've had a few comments here and there. Things about making the background more interesting or fixing. Um, you know, fixing something awkward about somebody's leg, or, or uh, I had a what's called a tangent in art, where you have something um, that the lines are touching. Like if Leo's holding his sword here, but the line actually touches the outer. It looks like his sword is sitting on his head. You lose the kind of uh, three dimensionality of him holding his sword out here, and suddenly it looks like the sword is resting there. on his head. So if you just rotate it back out, suddenly it pops forward. And I had a, I had a couple nasty tangents where it looked like things were resting on people's heads and arms. Uh, and so I just have to get in there and Photoshop and tweak it up. Now, what medias do you work with? How do you... I draw everything in pencil first, and then, um, and then I, I, uh, I do a little bit of digital tweaking to my pencils. I'll scan it in, and that's just if, um, if I've realized that I've drawn something slightly out of proportion. I've drawn the hand too small, or I realize that the arm is maybe a little too low, the shoulder should be up here. I can just digitally kind of cut the arm and slide it up, or enlarge the hand, or that kind of thing. Um, so I do a little bit of digital process, and then if it gets approved, I print that out at full size. Put it on a light, a light table, with my final uh, paper surface on top of it, like a blank sheet of, of artboard. And then I can see all the printout beneath it. And then I can ink with uh, I ink with with ink pens on top. And then once I have the ink work, in fact, I have some samples here. That kind of work. Okay. Which program do you use for your coloring? Do you use Adobe or? I'm, yeah, Photoshop? I'm using I'm using Photoshop, and I'm using an older <laughs> an older version. Everybody keeps laughing about how old it is, but it's uh, it was one of the the big updates that they did, where. Um, Everything in there is, it has basically has all the bells and whistles I'll need for what I'm doing. If I was doing photo retouching or, or um, actually putting together book, you know, entire books in the program or something like that, uh, I would need something bigger and stronger. But I'm, I'm using uh, 7, which is pre, for the Photoshop nerds, that's pre-CS. Now, with uh, doing all the covers and everything, do you have a favorite so far that you have done for the Turtle series? Uh, the Leo cover. This was the one that I said I was kind of struggling on where to put them, etc. And, and then was wandering around New York coming up with ideas. I was there for Comic-Con. And um, also when I got the notes back from Nickelodeon, um, they they felt like, or one of the comments was that the the background was, was maybe a little boring. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because of my covers, it was the one that I had put the most work into, uh, uh -huh. uh, detail-wise. So I thought, well, that's kind of weird, but you know, I'll, I'll try to make it more interesting. I'll try to play up some of the brickwork and stuff. But uh, and I decided to put more garbage in the in the alley to, to give it more things to look at. Uh, if they think it's boring, I'm going to really punch this up. And so I, I at the last minute decided to put it all in the rain. 
and did a sh an overlay sheet where I could draw all the rain and draw it dripping down his face. And because it's on an overlay, then I can isolate all those lines and make them semi-transparent so that it actually looks like rain. Um, and so it was like, I, because I was trying to prove something to them, I was trying to make up for the fact that they thought it was maybe a little boring, uh, I kind of went into overdrive. And so because of that, it's probably my best cover so far. Giving IDW a shot and they're really blowing us out of the water yeah, yeah. with the uh, material they're giving us. Yeah, so. it's been fun. It's Have been a fun you series. been keeping up with every issue as it comes out and stuff? No, no, unfortunately no. I haven't. I, I so rarely, this is one of the rare instances that I'm out of my basement. Because uh, I'm, I'm all the time, I've got covers to do or I've got mouse guard work to do or, or I'm at a convention. So, speaking about conventions that you do a lot of cons, what are some upcoming conventions in case any of our viewers would like to come and actually meet you? Uh, C2E2 in Chicago is coming up pretty soon. Um, as is uh, Free Comic Book Day, where I'm going to be out at uh, Jetpack Comics in New Hampshire. Um, man, trying to get me to remember a convention schedule off the top of my head. <laughs> of course, the big one, San Diego and New York. Um, San Diego's in the summer, New York's in the fall. Um, but like, oh, Heroes. I'm doing Heroes in June, which is South Carolina area. Um, if you go to the mouseguard.net website, there's a link for my appearances. And, uh, and that'll give well, that you a, that'll give you a complete list without me having to ramble and, and uh, forget <laughs> forget important conventions. Okay, definitely we'll have the link up there for anyone. And also, we'd like to mention that we are at Detroit Comics in Ferndale, Michigan. If anyone is in the area and looking for comics, be it Mouse Guard or Ninja Turtles, this is a location where you can get them at. So, um, with uh, the comics. What projects are you working on that are coming out soon? Uh, I'm, I'm still working on the third series, the third main story series of Mouse Guard that's called The Black Axe. Uh, issue 4 just hit about a week ago, and so I'm actually still working on issue 5 now. Um, when that gets to is issue 6, we'll wrap it up into a hardcover with extras and an epilogue and all that kind of thing. And then uh, we did a, an anthology series last year called Legends of the Guard, where other artists came in and told kind of the tall tales and folklore of, of the Mouse Guard world. We're doing another one of those. So right after I finish Black Axe, I have pages to do for that. And hopefully, um, because everybody's been already working on their portion of the Legends book, uh, as soon as I'm done with Black Axe and I can do my pages for the Legends series, um, that should be ready to publish pretty quickly. We won't have this major delay that is David Peterson. <laughs> It sounds like you got a lot going on. I do, that. I do. I also, I'm, I try to stay really involved with my fans, um, partly because I am so slow and I want to make sure that they don't think I've died. Um, so I, I tweet often, I'm on Facebook. Um, I also do um, live drawing sessions or live coloring sessions on, uh, on Ustream. And then I also have a weekly blog that I can never remember the URL for, but again, if you go to mouseguard.net and then click on the blog link, You'll find it, but what I like doing there is I do a lot of uh, process stuff. So I show all the steps from concept sketch up through final colors and, and showing the steps or talking about what I was thinking about at the time or what some of the struggles might have been. Um, and I've done those for all of the Turtles covers that I've done so far, including one of the ones got, um, got linked to some other site that, <laughs> like, if you look at the chart on, on uh, traffic, the Donatello cover went because it got picked up by another site um, to do the to do the sewer. I couldn't find good sewer reference photos, so I built a model of the sewer. I have seen okay. that model. I yeah. was wondering when you said you were bringing the art. I'm like, am I going to get to see that model? Yeah, not the model. It's, oh. I mean, it's only about that big, but I yeah, I wasn't gonna. <laughs> I wasn't gonna walk down the street into the comic shop with a sewer model under my arm. Yeah, I have seen pictures yeah, of the yeah. model. Yeah, so the, that if you're a Turtles fan and and, uh, and you want to see kind of the behind the scenes, definitely check out my blog. That's a, that's a good place to, to yeah. see what I'm doing. We will make sure that the link is up here for everyone interested because that sounds... Uh, i I got to see more of that. <laughs> the, spl um, the Splinter cover goes up uh, April 3rd, I believe. I think that's the date when... I mean, it's already been revealed... You know, yeah. IDW let it out and everything, but um, on my blog you'll see the Splinter cover without the logo and type, so you'll be able to see a little bit more detail, and then the whole process of how I did it. So. Awesome! That sounds fantastic. Great. So, that, wow, 
And are you thinking after, do you think the micro series is going to go on with other characters than the ones you already know about? Or As, as far as I know, there are eight issues planned. That's all yeah. I, I, if they go on beyond that, they haven't told me anything. Um, there was a point where because of deadlines, I was going to have to bow out after Casey um, and skip the April cover. And then Bobby said, no, 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 no. We really want to make sure. In fact, it, what he was trying to avoid was the Muppet situation where I get almost to the end and then drop off before it was done, the last yeah. one or two covers. So he said, it's okay. Um, so probably what's going to happen with the April cover is my cover won't get solicited. Because to get into to previews, the cover art has to be done and shipped off to Diamond way, way, way in advance. And there was just no way I could get it done with, with what I've got going on right now. And he said, that's okay. Um, if you can get it done before we go to print, it'll still get printed. It just won't have it, it won't have been shown in solicitation. Uh, then you get an you buy yourself an extra three months. And I was like, yeah, I can do that then. So Yay! so yeah, I'm doing an April cover and then the eighth cover. Ooh. Which I've been explicitly told not to say what the eighth cover is. Oh, we we can all anticipate something really cool. Like think, oh my God, what if it's Shredder? That would be cool. So <laughs> the, the, there's there's some ideas that could be yeah, out there I, for characters. So I, I look especially. around on some of the forums uh, to see if my cover. That's one of the ways sometimes I find out if my covers have if IDW has shared my cover is I go look in the forums to see because I have to know when I can put it on my blog. So I I kind of troll the net looking to see is that has that cover been released yet? And um, and when I was in one of the forums, they were, there was a lot of speculation over who the remaining characters. This is, I think, before Casey was announced or before April was announced. And there were, you know, two kind of question mark characters, and everybody was trying to figure out: is it, is it this person? Is it that person? Is it, you know? Well, Baxter's got a huge thing. Old Hob. We would love to see something of Old Hob. I mean, there's just so many great new characters that can also have it to help expand who they are in the, the series. Yeah, so. there are a lot of options. There, I mean, yeah. I, I'll tell you what, I thought before, because Bobby only told me uh, about a week ago what the eighth one was going to be. And before that, I I assumed I knew. Oh. I'm not saying that my assumption was right or not, but I assumed I knew. And then I went to a forum looking to, for the, looking to see if the Splinter cover had been released. And when I was on that forum, I saw everybody else offering up their ideas. And suddenly, I didn't feel like I could assume that I knew because then every other option seemed like, well, yeah, that's viable too, and that's a good option too. They could, I could totally see them going in that direction, and so it went from like, oh, I'm sure I know who it is, you know, one character, to then like, yeah, when you just, it, it was like five or six, and it was like, oh, they really could go any direction for that last cover, and now I do know which of those options it is, but <laughs> mum's the word. Oh, well, we can't wait to find that out, and we can't wait to see the other covers coming out by you. you. And I hope to see you also on more Turtle work besides this, because your work has been fantastic. Bobby and I have so. talked about um, me doing some interiors, but uh, the, the main issue is just me finding the time. It's, it's a, I mean, it's a lot of work to do the covers, um, but to do interior pages is is just a lot of it's a lot of work and it's really demanding and because of the nature of mouse guard it being something that I both write and draw um, I think what Bobby and I have talked about is maybe having me write and draw uh, an issue um, and so that that obviously takes that much more effort I would have to write everything up in advance and send it off for IDW and Nick to approve then get it back and it's just it's a lot of back and forth and so uh, we're, we're kind of waiting for a time where my schedule is going to actually allow that well hopefully that could happen yeah yeah I definitely I mean, I've pitched the... I've pitched story ideas to Bobby and uh, and yeah he's excited I'm excited so we'll see okay Thank you so much for yeah, joining us you. for uh, Calabunga Corner. Thank you. And we'll catch you guys next time as we bring out as much news as we can.